I'm going to tell you a story. It's a good one. I dig it. It's the story of Thomas P. Stafford, a man of the future, but deep down, just a kid from Oklahoma with big dreams. A true hero, focused, determined, and fearless. Tom Stafford lived in the skies, but was a man of the world, piloting America to the moon and forging peace between bitter rivals. His talent took us to a new age, pushing forward the creation of the B-2 bomber and stealth technologies. This is no ordinary man, and even today, we're still following his plan for where to explore next. Yet, this isn't just his story. It's also yours. Look, I know you're thinking, this guy's nothing like you, but give me a sec. Tom has done some pretty incredible stuff in his life, but his story doesn't start with spacecraft and moon missions. His story starts right here, in Weatherford, Oklahoma, where he first began to dream. But, to tell it right, we gotta rewind. The full story starts here. To really get Tom, you gotta get his folks, Thomas and Mary. That's her there. Now, she came to Oklahoma as a kid in a covered wagon. Crazy. And when she grew up, she became a teacher. This is his dad, a dentist who moved in from the east and established his practice in Oklahoma. So you got these two insanely brave, wickedly smart people who pioneer their way into Oklahoma's early history, and the result of all that talent? They have a kid. Every afternoon as a little boy, four or five years old, I'd watch what I thought was a giant silver bird flying over. And that was a DC-3, and I'd look at it and look at it, and I said, I want to do that. This is Tom Stafford. He was born in Weatherford, Oklahoma on September 17, 1930. Eventually, he'd break the human speed record, become a general and a NASA astronaut. But when he was a kid, he just really loved airplanes. So he works really hard in school, especially in math and science. And when he's out of high school, he joins the Naval Academy, learning how to be a pilot, and graduates at the top of his class. It's around this time that Tom picks up his motto, higher, faster. This kid loved to fly, and he loved to push limits. Tom joined the Air Force and started test flying planes, the new ones, the fastest jet fighters of the day, until he became one of the top test pilots in the nation. He was so good, he caught the eye of NASA, who selected him for the second group of astronauts in the early American space program. Now he had a chance to fly past the clouds, beyond our atmosphere to that beautiful moon he used to dream of. No more clouds, just stars. Tom Stafford would fly four historic space missions in his astronaut career, and the first was the Gemini 6. This mission would make history. Their goal? to send two spacecraft up into orbit above the atmosphere, one after the other, and to have them meet in space, coming within one foot of touching each other, both traveling at 17,000 miles per hour. This would be the first rendezvous in space, and Tom's first time as an astronaut. Tom wrote about it in his book, saying, I finally saw the Earth's horizon appear in the lower part of my window. What a sight. The Earth's atmosphere was a curved, pale blue line. The clouds below were small and racing fast. Below us, the nighttime surface of the Earth was alive with thunderstorms and the flashing of meteorites. I could see ten times as many stars as I could on a clear night. 
the Milky Way was truly a gigantic puddle of stars. The mission was successful. Despite the speed, despite the difficulty, the craft got within one foot of touching each other. After some brief experiments, Tom headed home. What an adventure. Through the knowledge they gained, Tom Stafford brought us all one step closer to achieving the greatest aeronautical challenge known to man, landing a human being onto the surface of the moon. Because that was the deal. That's what all this was building up towards. Tom's next mission, the Gemini 9, would take place only six short months after his first flight in space. This time, Gene Cernan would be his partner, and the objective would be to meet up and dock with an unmanned Agena target vehicle. Or, in other words, a spacecraft with no astronaut in it. The vehicle had missing components on it that made the task impossible. Tom called it an angry alligator, and it posed danger to try to do anything with. They simply couldn't dock with it. So the second part of the mission was for Gene to test the new astronaut maneuvering unit, or the rocket pack, that had just been invented for astronauts. But Gene overpowered his environmental unit and his whole suit inflated to where he could hardly move. It was ridiculously hot, and that part of the mission couldn't be completed either. Gemini 9 proved to be a very difficult mission, but everyone learned something, and all this stuff would get fixed for the next time. Plus, Tom proved that he was cool when things went wrong. He could deal with issues. He could make good, tough decisions. He could salvage things. He would need that, because someone had to run the test mission before the biggest mission of them all. Apollo 11 would bring us to the moon. The Apollo 10 could make sure that it could be done. This was Tom's third mission. He knows what he's about at this point. He's gone high and fast, but he's ready for higher and faster, just like he always has been. And he would get it. The Gemini missions are done. They're out of the way. The moon mission is ready to go, except they need someone to test it out. Tom Stafford's mission would be to go through everything the moon mission would go through, down to the very last detail, with the only exception being that they would not touch down on the moon's surface. Even still, this is the big one. Landing on the moon is so close, everyone can taste it. It's the stuff of dreams, and Tom's going to get to see it up close. It would start with the maneuvers he had done before. They docked the command module, nicknamed Charlie Brown, together with the lunar module, named Snoopy, and are ready to get going. Tom has always been big on cameras, and he manages to bring one on to do live broadcasts from the spacecraft. One glance back at Earth, and they push out of orbit. A few small problems stand out to the team, but nothing life-threatening and nothing that won't be able to be fixed. You got Tom, you got Gene Cernan from the last mission, and you got John Young. They are more than ready to be starting on their three-day voyage to the moon. They had arrived. None of these men had ever been this close. The Earth had never been so far away. Charlie, it might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. Tom and his buddy Gene load up into Snoopy, while Young stays behind in the command module Charlie Brown. But on their way to get near the moon's surface, Snoopy begins spinning out of control. Stafford and Gene have punched something wrong to the control computer, but these guys are such pros that they have it back under control almost immediately. Had they spun around a couple more times, they would have crashed into the surface of the moon, and there would have been no way for us to get them back. But they kept going. They run through everything. They get so close, and Tom becomes the first astronaut to pilot a lunar module in the moon's orbit. Then they redock with Charlie Brown, and let Snoopy go, off into the vastness of space. With that, the path was smooth. They take photos and calculations so the next astronauts of Apollo 11 would be able to set foot on the moon in the next mission a moon landing was possible. Real talk, y'all. I don't know if I could have resisted the opportunity of touching down on the surface of the moon. I don't know if I could have passed that up. We've been talking about how Tom was a great man, but the bread and butter why that is, is while Tom was courageous and took risks and pushed forward, he had this restraint. He was willing to be a piece of the puzzle so that other guys like his buddy Gene would be able to touch the surface of the moon. Tom never did. That's a different type of heroism. 
The crew of the Apollo 10 had to fire away from the moon's gravitational pull to get back to the Earth, and in so doing, they set the all-time human speed record at a blazing 24,791 miles per hour. That would get you from Weatherford to Oklahoma City in about 8 seconds. In this one mission, Tom had gone higher and faster than any other human being, and to this day no one has ever surpassed that record. That's highest and fastest. Three missions to space is a lot. Tom had made history more than once. His name is set in the annals of space flight forever, and he would be remembered. But somehow, he wasn't done yet. Mission 4, the Apollo Soyuz. Tom's last mission and the last mission of the Apollo program. This would be the end of space travel for both of them, the grand finale, the victory lap. And yet, it really wasn't about either of them. It wasn't about going out with a bang. Tom and Apollo had set the records. This was about the future, about all the astronauts to come, and about NASA's motto, to be for the benefit of everybody. We knew space wasn't just going to be for America. It was for every brave, crazy human being who wanted to fling themselves out into the cosmos. So we came up with a new dream, to build an international space station, the ISS, a laboratory and exhibitory revolving around the sky where astronauts conduct experiments and gain knowledge to help people on Earth and for future space travel. The idea was for a ton of nations to be able to use the station, but that dream had to start with making peace with our rivals. Meet Alexei Leonov. Backstory, he was the first dude to ever walk in space, a real hero to his country, a cool guy. He will command half of this joint Russian-American mission to dock together two crafts above the atmosphere, and Tom Stafford will command the American half of the mission. So you got Tom, this Oklahoma boy, and Alexei, a Russian cosmonaut. They become big buds and pick up each other's languages and cultures. While they're doing that, the American and Russian scientists are working together to create the universal docking system this mission would require. And it went off without a hitch. Docking went great, and an iconic film was taken to commemorate this handshake in space. A handshake between friends, between spacecraft, countries, and ways of life. They exchange flags, they perform experiments, and they eat each other's space foods. They each got to experience what it was like on a space mission with members of another country. All the stuff they've kept secret from each other during the space race for years, and now they're sharing it willingly between each other. This was a symbol, a beginning, a symbolized lack of boundaries when it came to science and spaceflight. It was proof that great men from different countries, from different sides of beliefs and opinions, could come together and do cool stuff. Tom once again showed his selflessness. This mission didn't get Tom higher or faster, it just gave him a friend, Alexei, someone he'd be friends with for the rest of his life. They still hang out to this day. The Apollo Soyuz mission was incredibly significant, and it was the first step in a much greater journey. Ultimately, it was about the future. Today, it may seem pretty normal to see pictures of astronauts working in space, or pictures from Earth from way up there, but we've only been able to do that since your grandparents were about your age. Tom Stafford was one of the first ones to go out there. He was a pioneer, an adventurer, and an explorer. It's dangerous being an explorer, to do something no one else has done, but that's how our country grows. That's how our world grows. It was people like Tom Stafford that proved we could go into space to survive out there, to figure out all the many things we had to learn, so that people like you will have a chance to explore the stars and discover new and incredible things. So here's the gist. Just because you come from a small town or state doesn't mean you can't do amazing things. Tom was just a kid from Weatherford, and if he could do it, so can you.